Hi everyone, uh, my name is Zaleika Sheik and I'm UCLan Students Union President and I'm here today with Graham Baldwin, UCLan's Vice Chancellor, for a question and answer session to put forward your students' questions. I want to thank students you know, who took the time out to send questions for Graham and I just want to thank Graham for supporting the Q&A today. First of all, are you able to just give students an overview of your role and responsibilities as the Vice Chancellor at UCLan? Oh, gosh. Yeah. See, I'm the vice chancellor of the university and uh, basically the vice chancellor is the uh, chief uh, academic and administrative officer of the university. So uh, my role really is uh, to ensure that uh, we fulfill the uh, university strategy and ensure that we maintain, you know, all of the things that we need to maintain, like our financial security and our appropriate operations and, 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 and so forth. Uh, so I work with a great team of people uh, right across the university and between us, we sort of uh, are uh, instrumental in, in um, ensuring that we fulfill the strategic objectives of the university. Brilliant. So a really um, powerful role that you've got and um, you obviously had an experience working at UCLan uh, in the past as well. I started out my career as a PE teacher yeah, and I really enjoyed that. I, I enjoyed working with young people. I enjoyed the educational uh, process. Um, and I got the opportunity to work in a university and I came into university. And I've been in universities ever since. I think my heart's always been in uh, UCLan. Uh, my um, family continued to live in Lancashire. And um, this is a, a university with huge potential. Uh, it does some great things. And um, it's a real privilege to work here. OK, so we're going to kick off. Um, so throughout this Q&A, you might, you might hear us mentioning things around learning outcomes. And so I'm just going to clarify the, you know, the meaning of this for our students today. Mm -hmm. So learning outcomes are statements of knowledge, skills and abilities individual students should possess and can demonstrate upon completion of a learning experience or sequence of learning experiences. So we're going to get straight into it. So through my involvement on the COVID recovery group, it's been you know absolutely brilliant to see the university have invested in COVID um, secure campus and put in place those appropriate arrangements to ensure there is you know ventilation in teaching rooms, for example. The latest government announcement you know has provided universities with a bit more guidance to say when certain students on practical courses, for example, should now be accommodated for those face-to-face -face teaching elements on campus. So my question to Graham then is. You know, we're towards the end of February now, and as you're aware, you know, some students have, haven't stepped foot on campus all year. How are the university going to ensure students can catch up on the gap in their learning that they have experienced this year so that they can be confident to operate equipment, operate software in the real world? I hope very much that um, the gap has not been uh, too big. I'm well aware that, um, you know, it is a challenge when you need to uh, operate practically and you can't get back into the specialist rooms and to use the specialist facilities. Um, but we are, you know, really, really pleased that the government has said that students can return from um, the 8th of, of uh, March, not forgetting, of course, that a considerable number of students are on practical courses and those that are involved in the uh, preparation of what are considered to be key workers, but particularly those students in medical uh, programs or, or medical programs and in health uh, programs. They have returned from January and they've been uh, having face-to-face -face, uh, teaching or they're on placement. Um, but this now allows the remaining students who have significant practical requirements to get back on campus and to uh, catch up. And my colleagues have been working incredibly hard. Um, it, it is quite logistically difficult to ensure that we can get people onto campus in the numbers that we need them to be on, but also to spread out their teaching such that you don't have too many people in one particular area of the university at any given time, because obviously we've still got the restrictions in place around social distancing and such such like. So colleagues are working literally around the clock in terms of preparing the timetable. And for those areas where there is that significant practical element required, um, obviously, that's being timetable to make sure that students get the opportunity to do that practical activity. And we are trying to uh, put more teaching in so that there is you know, really compressed. Uh, it's not ideal, but, but put as much time as possible in so that students can get access to those specialist facilities. And clearly, we'll be looking to see what is needed for us to work out of hours um, and over you know, the Easter period and into um, next semester to ensure that students uh, are able to 
A, uh, complete their program and B, to progress in a timely manner. And that's what we are aiming at, to make sure that students are able to complete what it is they need to complete and to complete it within the time frame that they expect to complete it. And that's what's driving us at the moment. And that's how we're managing the timetable. Brilliant. Thanks, Graham. It's really important those students are um, given that communication in as much time as possible so that they can make those appropriate arrangements should they have to you know, travel to campus and be there for that, that kind of element of the face to face teaching. And um, mentioned, the government mentioned around, you know, colleges and um, primary schools, how there might be some sort of summer school arrangement for um, catching up on that gap in the learning. We, we know a lot of um, people who are possibly thinking of coming to HE. Yeah. Um, do you think there's the university looking at doing something like that as well there? Yeah, well, a few things on, on that. I mean, firstly, you mentioned communications. <clears throat> totally agree. And we, as soon as we have the finalised timetables, the students will be uh, notified. I think between us, I'd like to think the university and the student union have done huge amount of communication uh, on an ongoing basis. And um, there's an old saying that you can never do enough communication. And I think that's probably right. And I would love to as, to be able to do more and more specific communication, but we are communicating as, as regularly and as readily as we can. And I think that we've already gone out, well, I know we've already gone out and explained to students what the, the broader plans are, but also saying that we will be coming back to you with more specific detail uh, as soon as we can and uh, we should have a timetable by the beginning of next week so the week's notice there mm -hmm. Zalika but students uh, will know which courses are expecting to come back for the eighth so uh, hopefully that that helps so I, I agree with you totally there in terms of catching up it, it'll depend really I think on the nature of the course uh, the um, which year the students are in and what they're moving on to um, clearly for students who have um, got some gap but are returning for studies in the next academic year clearly there's opportunities there uh, for them to um, potentially uh, get into uh, practical spaces and to to make up any uh, further uh, gap that may still exist but hopefully won't um, it's more difficult I guess for students who are completing this year um, but we are working on um, a program of activity at the moment uh, for the summer to uh, ensure that we are giving broad support for uh, students as much as possible so that they are, are able, you know, not only for this issue, but other issues as well that will have uh, occurred as a consequence of the pandemic and, and as a consequence of not being able to get onto campus. And just to make sure that our students are as prepared as they can be, uh, despite the circumstances, to, to go out into the world of work or to progress to their next academic year. Absolutely. And as much as we can do, you know, the student union and the university working together to ensure that those students are able to catch up on that, that gap in the learning, however that may be, um, and making sure they have that opportunity to do that. Because, you know, what they flick through on the open day, what they flick through on the prospectus, you know, um, and what they thought, I'm going to have I'm going to have this this experience and I'm going to operate this equipment. And um, we want to make sure that those students are confident. So my next kind of Moving on, uh, back in 2008, you took um, up, like you said, the pro the position of Pro Vice Chancellor for Skills and Employer Engagement at UConn. Um, and then following this, you played a really key role in helping um, your previous institution, Solent, rise significantly uh, in all major league tables, achieving high results for student satisfaction and employability. Um, so my question is, do you think employers here will have confidence in a UConn degree now on the skills our students possess? Yeah, I'm, I'm really confident they will, actually, Zalika. You know, the university's relationships with um, outside organisations, employers are really very strong. And I think this university is very highly regarded for its employer engagement. So, the, the you know, the work we do, the collaboration we do with uh, organisations and industry. But we've, you know, got really very well-developed programmes in a huge breadth of areas. And, you know, that relationship we've got with employers is uh, very strong. They recognize the quality of our graduates. They recognize the quality of our provision. We are very keen for our programs to be employer informed so that the where it is possible, the employers are uh, helping to direct the content, the assessment and so forth. And of course, you'll be aware that an awful lot of our courses already have uh, professional body accreditations and uh, and so forth and that's really important as well they're nationally and indeed many cases internationally recognized 
and that helps uh, uh, help students. So I think that um, I've got every confidence. I think that universities' reputation is strong. I think it's been enhanced as well as a consequence of the pandemic, because uh, and some of our students may not know just the magnificent response that came from the university last year, um, uh, well, all year, but started last year in response to COVID and how we joined the fight, if you like. I was particularly proud of the uh, nursing and medical students who graduated early and have gone straight into the front line. Of course, a lot of our, our other our allied health uh, students have, have done likewise. Um, but through you know, engineering, we were manufacturing uh, specialist valves, some of the breathing apparatus for some of the local hospitals. We made um, PPE. Uh, we had um, NHS staff in the accommodation so they could stay and get easy access to the local hospital without potentially infecting their families. We had the sports uh, hall turned into a, a kind of a nightingale recovery hospital, which thankfully we didn't have to use, but it was there and available. We've got three different types of coronavirus testing going on on campus at the moment. You know, so there's the, the ones that the students will be familiar with at the moment, the lateral flow test. Where we're doing some work for the NHS around the lamp test and we've got uh, PCR testing going on over in Vernon car park. So I could go on. And I think uh, as a consequence of that, you know, an awful lot of the organisations and the bodies within the region in particular have recognised, you know, the contribution and the strength of that contribution that UCLan has made. And I would say its reputation has been enhanced, Zalika. So I don't have a, a concern about that, that employers do have confidence in UCLan degree. And, and I can't say anything about this one yet, but a massive employer in the area it, it, we're in discussions with at the moment around a memorandum of understanding to take forward mutual opportunities. And, uh, you know, that's a reflection of the how they see the institution. And, and of course, any university is seen in the light of the quality of its graduates. And, and therefore, I, I take that as a stamp of approval that we're doing the right things our graduates are highly accomplished, very able. And so I have no doubt that uh, that they will, the employers will still have confidence in the graduates coming out from this university and in particular this university this year. Absolutely. And I, and I think you, you touched on a lot of key areas there. And I think one of the main things, you've got the degree, but we want students to get involved in other experiences, mm -hmm. whether that's, you know, playing for a sport club, playing for taking part in a society or getting involved in a bit of volunteering and you know, we saw you on the news just a couple of days ago talking about the student testing and our healthcare students were, um, you know, supporting that initiative and making sure that, you know, they're developing key skills that are going to make them employable. Yeah. Well, one of the, the phrases we've been using uh, recently, and it will appear in the new strategic plan for universities, is the concept of real world learning. And what we really mean by that is just, you know, it's applied, it's practical, it's focused on the real world. So hopefully the skills that you develop, the education that you go through in the university is developing you and providing you with that practical experience that will enable you to go out into the world of work. And I mentioned the testing earlier, and I think it's brilliant that we've got all this testing going on. But the best thing about it, without a doubt, is that it's employing our students to help to administer those tests. So biomedical students, nursing students, students on healthcare programs, et cetera, are getting you know, relevant experience, but whilst helping their fellow students and helping university staff. In fact, I've got to go straight off for my test after this uh, conversation. So, you know, I think I think that's the best thing about it. And that's what I'm really proud of. And that's why I was so pleased to be able to highlight it on the telly the other night. That You know, the, the great thing about it is the wonderful work that, that those students are doing in enabling us to, uh, you know, put on a testing that, that provides us that with, with that reassurance that we've got a safe environment. And, you know, the, 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 the key priorities for the university at the moment are the health and safety and well-being of our students and staff and, of course, their education. And, and that's what we're, we're completely focused on. And you kill two birds with one stone again when you've got students getting that real-world experience by providing support that then enables us to ensure that the health, safety and well-being of our staff and students is uh, is optimised. So, yeah, it's really, really good. Absolutely. I think it's about now we've got moving into March, it's about giving students and staff that confidence that, you know, we are going to only have those practical courses on campus, those that actually, you know, require that that teaching that they haven't had yet um, and that, that kind of practical element to ensure that, you know, we're not having overcrowded um, campuses and that those COVID secure measures that have been put in place are going to be, you know, effective. 
yeah, I mean, I mentioned earlier that, that the timetabling team are working around the clock. And, and the reason that it's it's so complicated is because it's not a case of just saying, yes, come back. We're trying to make sure as many students are back as possible, getting the practical experience they need. But at any given time, keeping the numbers on campus as low as we can for, for obvious reasons. But I, I do, you know, there is hopefully light at the end of the tunnel. And I do hope that we'll soon have more people able to get back and to enjoy university campus experience. Because for those of us who have been on campus for a lot of the time over the last year, it doesn't feel the same, does it? When, you know, this, this, these places need people, they need students, they need that vibrant energy that comes from, you know, the education process with students and, uh, and we're just missing that. So yeah, let's hope that uh, we can get back to a more normal for next year. Yeah, it's all about that social interaction and students haven't had that, you know, virtually. And so I think, yeah, students are craving, you know, coming back to campus when it when it's safe. OK, yeah. let's move on to a little bit of a different question around student support. Um, yeah. So as you're aware, there are some students campaigning with the slogan 9K for what, um, who want more support for students. Uh, do you think the university are offering enough support for all students? Yeah, this, it's, it's, it's a really difficult one, isn't it? Nobody's getting the experience quite in the way that they would want it or had hoped for it, I'm sure. I, you know, know that that's a challenge and, and, and I know it partly, you and I have talked about this before, my youngest son is still going through the, I've got two of my three children in the university system, but, but one of them on a, a taught program at the moment. And, um, you know, I can see from his experience, it's not what he uh, wanted, it's not as he anticipated it. He didn't expect that he'd be sitting in his uh, room uh, on team or teams or zoom on, on a constant basis so I, I see it from both sides you know I really do uh, I, I feel for him not getting that exactly what you just said that social engagement your in peer interaction the opportunity to to join in clubs and activities and societies he is actually like, like you um, keen on sport and would have been playing I think university sport but he's just not got that opportunity Unfortunately, though, that is a, a consequence of this pandemic and nobody from any walk of life has not been affected by this. So what we're trying to do is, is make the best of, of, of it uh, and to provide the students with support. A huge amount of effort has gone into it. And, and again, I commend my colleagues, particularly in student services, working with yourselves in the student union, as I've already said, but right across the university and the academic registry, all of our academics, etc., who have have really moved incredibly quickly to provide support. We've put additional support into student welfare. And we've put more support into a whole raft of, of other activities uh, to try and help where we know problems are, are building up. Um, we've invested a huge amount of money in terms of that support, uh, in terms of alterations and things to the campus. So um, we are working incredibly hard and trying to do as much as we can to make sure that the students are able to continue their studies and at the end of it to, as I said earlier, progress and to complete in a timely manner. And, uh, and that's where uh, our efforts have, have really been. So I think there's, you know, what I would say is it's very, very difficult to make up for the challenges that we've faced as a consequence of, of having to, to be in lockdown. But we have worked incredibly hard to do as much as we can and I'm confident that, uh, you know, we are giving as good an experience as we can during this very difficult time. But I'm not saying it equals the experience you would otherwise get. Yeah, it is completely different experience, you know, virtual learning. And we know some students haven't um, actually, you know, stepped foot on campus all semester, all, all the year. Um, and some are actually studying, you know, from their home countries, international students, for example. But I think what's been really great is, you know, just in, in the middle of the pandemic, the university have supported one of the student union campaigns, which is to appoint the first biracial mental health counsellor. And like you talked around um, investing in the mental health provision, we know we've seen an increase in, you know, students wanting um, support, uh, well-being support, and that that has been um, noticed by the university and they've actually, you know, stepped in to, to support support students even more and we've seen it through you know well-being checks as well when students have had to isolate but what what has been really great is the amount of support that we've received through the OFS um, and we received a considerable amount through UPLAN for the, the financial hardship fund um, do you want to just talk around how that, that has actually really supported our students in such a tough time when a lot of lost jobs and you know experiencing digital poverty and landlords haven't actually you know provided those rent rebates yeah, well, it, yeah. I mean, it, it's been a real challenge, hasn't it, over the course of two academic years now. So the university uh, has a range of hardship funds in place, and 
we extended that when the uh, COVID hit and we recognized that students were in really difficult circumstances trying to work from home with, you know, as you say, poor internet uh, connection or not enough hardware and the opportunity to access. So uh, we've been doing an awful lot through our own hardship funds in time, tr in terms of trying to address issues around digital poverty, as you've said. So we were sending out dongles, we've been sending out computers, laptops um, to students in need and making sure that they can still access their learning. Um, more recently, we've had challenges, as you say, because we've had uh, you know consecutive lockdowns and um, students therefore having accommodation costs, uh, et cetera. So the government has made 70 million pounds available, uh, which has been administered through the Office for Students directly to universities and they've based that on uh, the profile of the student body that, that each university's got and as you say we got a considerable amount of money that we've been uh, advertising recently that students have been able to apply to that fund uh, for support for a variety of reasons uh, some of that being accommodation cost other living costs and so forth and we've had a really good response to that I think you're on the panel aren't you working with colleagues to uh, determine you know, who meets the criteria for that. And all of that funding will be distributed before the end of March, so very soon. And, um, you know, I, I would commend the work, again, that's gone on across the piece to, to make this money become available to universities relatively quickly, and um, that universities gone through a process which I think is rigorous, but hopefully not burdensome in terms of the students. They can put their uh, application in, and hopefully, you know, students will be benefiting that very soon and getting that support. We also, as an institution, were able to provide a, a, a rebate uh, to an extent in terms of the accommodation costs. And um, so hopefully students are benefiting from that. You talked about summer preparation. We've obviously offered as well four weeks free accommodation for all uh, of our contract holders within the university so they can uh, extend their time in, in university hall by a further four weeks, which we hope will help them in terms of any other uh, activities that they, they need to do. And for those who can't get back um, as a consequence of the changes to the dates now, we'll be coming out with some announcements for them as well with regard to the next uh, instalment. So um, everything's hopefully being covered on that basis. Brilliant. And I think it's just such a, you know, a big uh, well done and thank you to, you know, the student services who had to work, you know, really hard to ensure they get through all the student applications. I think they had more than, you know, 2000 applications, which is extortionate, but it just shows how the communication, like we mentioned before, has actually been really positive, whether that's through the student newsletter or targeted emails through through the eye um, and students actually, you know, receiving that and thinking, OK, I need the support and I'm going to apply and there's no barriers to actually applying. Yeah, no, I hope so. I mean, I, I think you're right. It's it, well, you're 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 in the thick of it, so you know how difficult it is to go through that number of applications, and uh, they're being sort of scored as soon as they come through, aren't they? In readiness for the you know, sort of general um, consideration, but it, it it's it is really difficult. I think it, it's great that we've uh, got so many uh, applications, but it also you know represents the significance of the challenge doesn't it that there are that that many students who um, have to apply to the hardship fund because they're in difficult circumstances and as I say you know that, that I really feel for them and um, you know I hope this does make a, a difference a meaningful difference and help them uh, to get through the, uh, the the coming weeks. Brilliant so do you see beyond April the university extending that kind of financial support and making sure that you know throughout the summer students are are supported and I'm sure there's another another of uh, other bursaries the university could you know ensure that students are are supported yeah well the, the university always has uh, hardship funds and uh, funds that it uses to support uh, students in need so that's with or without a pandemic we always recognize that that there are going to be students with hardship and and special requirements that, that the university wants to help it's part of the uh, mission uh, of this institution so uh, I think there are two things. The, I think the, if the lockdown uh, continued and, you know, hopefully we were on the roadmap to coming out. But if the university wasn't able to open up and start again, uh, as we hope, over the course of the summer, then I think there'll be a call made to see if then any further government support can be made in the same way. And I think it's been very clear that the tranche of funding that we've just recently received is for the now. And we need to see then what comes. Um, but if things are working um, as we hope, 
then you know there will be support mechanisms in place within the university. Uh, I I'm not sure quite how much or what you know yeah. what basis we'll be uh, distributing it, but you know we always have funds that we are looking to utilise to support students who have uh, challenges with regard to hardship and welfare. Absolutely. And it's so great to see, you know, vice chancellors coming together. I know you you meet regularly and it's and it's great when they come together and actually say, look, the HE sector, our students actually need support. Because I think a lot of attention gets focused on, you know, the, the primary high school and college college students. And it's, it's nice when it comes from vice chancellors to say, look, have you forgotten about us? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think the um, the sector was uh, came together very quickly. It does work well well as a sector, but it came together very quickly last year and uh, was communicating with government throughout and has continued to do that. And the communication channels between the universities and the, and the government, I think, is good. And but we were you know very aware that this was going to cause an awful lot of problems for for students. I mean, it's really complex because we've got so many different types of student in so many different types of circumstance and situation. Uh, so you know, but clearly needs within the university sector was, was going to be going to be great and high, and you know the government have listened and uh, and they have responded. You know, not to everything, obviously that you know, the, but you know there is support there and it, it is good. But university uh, VCs and senior colleagues continue to work together to emphasise what what needs there are, you know, what the challenges are, what the the issues are and um, and what government can do to best help students moving forward. Brilliant. Thank you, Graham. OK, so we're now going to cover student fees and that this kind of idea of facilities that students have paid for within these student fees. So we know student fees um, cover access to university facilities and specialist rooms, including, you know, our sport complexes, whether that's the Sir Tom Finney Sports Centre or the UCLAN Arena and social and study spaces. But this year, students haven't been able to fully access those facilities due to government restrictions. Will the university look to support students to extend things like gym memberships, access to certain facilities or software to final year students after they graduate? So I know we touched on final year students and that kind of yeah. That kind of aspect. So, yeah. What do you think about that? Well, certainly our intention is that you don't just graduate and you leave the university. I think that's always the case. Uh, you know, you, you're a part of UCLan forever, really. Uh, you know, you, you be join the alumni and, um, the, you know, the, the association and hopefully support continues uh, throughout. This university is one of the few that in terms of sports facilities specifically that don't charge uh, for their facilities in addition to, to the fee. Um, Majority of, of universities, certainly ones that I'm familiar with, uh, would would have an additional fee that you would need to pay. Now, thankfully, because we don't charge a fee, we've not run into the challenge of saying, well, should we reimburse that fee or whatever? Uh, uh, but what about next year? I wouldn't like to make any promises just as we sit here now, only because I don't know. Um, I, you know, there are probably some quite complex arrangements in terms of, you know, at the moment, you can get into the facilities because you've got a student card. You're clearly a registered student, et cetera, et cetera. How would we manage that when you've got individuals who aren't registered, et cetera, et cetera? So what I would like to say is that, that in principle, we are committed to ongoing support for our students beyond graduation. And some of the specifics that you ask about, uh, although I am warm to the idea for sure of providing such support, I'm not sure quite what the implications of that are and how how actually possible it is to administer that. So uh, so that's why I hesitate to say yes or no, but to say that I am, you know, I, I can certainly see that why it's, a, you know, you're asking it. I think it's a good idea, um, but certainly we will be looking at how we can give further support to students once they've graduated. Yeah, and it's been really great to see um, Andrew Ireland, who's your Pro Vice Chancellor for Students and Teaching, working on a Graduate with Confidence um, you know, package um, with our education officer, Steph Lomas. And it's been brilliant to see that kind of um, student union perspective feeding into that. Um, and, I, and I work closely through my employability aspect on my manifesto um, with the UCLan Career Service. And, you know, that's a lifelong service for students um, yeah. and they can access it whenever they want. Um, and I think that's that's brilliant. And then we've also got the propeller um, in the enterprise and maybe extending, you know, um, a couple of extra years for students who possibly didn't think about doing enterprise in the middle of a pandemic. But maybe we, we offer that going forward as well. Yeah, there's some good ideas there. I'm glad you mentioned uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor for Students and Teaching, uh, Andrew Ireland. And um, that's, a, that's a relatively new role. We introduced that to the university back in 
think sort of the early part of 2020, perhaps late 19, early 20. And, you know, the whole idea was we, we didn't at that point know we were going to go through this global pandemic and that we would need particular emphasis on, on student support. But we did know that it was an area of work that we wanted to further enhance. And I think having somebody who is senior within the university whose focus is on students and teaching is really, really important. And uh, Andrew, as you know, leads student services, who we've already said, doing a great job. And, um, you know, I think it, it was it, it was great to have that role. I think that role is proving itself. And I think Andrew and student services are doing a great job. So, you know, I appreciate you mentioning that. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. OK, we're going to move on to our next question. We're getting some really positive feedback at the SU um, through our course representatives and school presidents on how lecturers are actually engaging students when it comes to online learning using creative and innovative teaching methods. However, what would you advise a student to do if they're not receiving a positive online experience and for what they think should be the education they signed up to? Yeah, um, well, I think the first point would be to speak speak to your tutors. Hopefully you've got the opportunity to, to do that. Um, you know, what you say there is, is probably no different from normal times. You know, the, when you, you have face-to-face -face classes or online classes, there are those of us who really enjoy and rate a class uh, and, and others who feel more disappointed with it for various reasons. Yeah. I do a thing called um, shadow a student. Mm -hmm. And we obviously can't do that at the moment because, of again, we, we, we're not able to uh, go into class. But I've done that both at Solent and, and uh, started it here just after I came back. And that's a fascinating experience. And I go in with the student and the whole idea is, is to try and get a sense of the experience that the student's getting uh, for, for an average day. So I go into class with them. We go for coffee. We talk about things, you know, go around. It's really insightful. Really enjoy it. But I, I've been really intrigued because I've sat through sessions. You bear in mind, I have an education background and I, and I, and I think, oh, this isn't going so well. I don't think much of this session, et cetera, et cetera. And I come out and I sit down with my, you know, the group, uh, uh, um, uh, the student I'm shadowing plus their friends. And I say, what do you think of that? I, you know, and, and I, my view is, and they went, oh, it's great. You know, really enjoyed it. And I'm like, so what am I missing? So, you know, there are different interpretations, aren't there, of how a class is, is going. I think I recognize that it's definitely more difficult online. Putting together online material and delivering it is really challenging. I mean, we find it tiring, I think, being on Teams meetings all day, which we spend a lot of our time doing, but actually delivering uh, through that uh, mechanism, uh, I know is very tiring. The material takes a lot of time to put together. And I think, you know, invariably, you're going to get ups and downs in terms of how we perceive the quality of some of those sessions. But I do know that people are working incredibly hard and really want to ensure that the students do get a good session. So sometimes they probably just need to be made aware that a student isn't necessarily getting quite from that session what they would hope but they might not be aware if they don't get any feedback relating to that so it's about communication so the starting point i think would be have a conversation with a tutor drop them a, a line or whatever uh and, and and failing that you know speak to uh course leaders and colleagues within the in their school just to make them aware that they don't think necessarily it's providing quite what they wanted or had hoped um, but as i say I, you don't always know because we've all got different views and perceptions as to whether a session has gone well or not and you know teaching sometimes uh you know i used to think i'd, I'd done a great session and, and then the evidence would be from the feedback that it clearly wasn't and, and vice versa interestingly enough uh, however much preparation and and whatever i i'd put into it so it's not an exact science so uh, it comes back to that thing we talked about earlier communicate communication let them know Absolutely. And I think it's really great if lecturers are really proactive in seeking that feedback from their students. So it's not always, you know, have to go to the course rep, but actually are the lecturers saying, how, how did you find that session? You know, is there anything that you think maybe you'd like to see more of or, you know, and then taking that feedback and actually um, using that to shape, you know, future future lectures going forward. Um, so what, what kind of departments at the university are, are there to support lecturers in terms of developing creative teaching solutions and um, making people, making students feel like, actually, my lecturer is doing X, Y and Z training and that's how yeah. I can now feel confident in what I'm receiving? Well, we have the Centre for Collaborative Learning, uh, which again resides with uh, Andrew Island under the Students and Teaching uh, banner. And that's new, um, it's, it, but it's, it's a development we've always had. Uh, an, an internal 
uh, organization here, or certainly ever since I was here, um, that looks at how we improve pedagogy um, or delivery in terms of education um, across the university. Uh, staff are able to do a variety of courses and programs and such like. Uh, they do a, a PGCE in terms of um, developing as as a tutor, which covers you know uh, some of the basic organisational things and enables them to challenge their expertise in a subject then into a way that is is meaningful for for colleagues. So that centre for collaborative learning will be pushing initiatives, etc. We've also got the technology learning support individuals within that who have been absolutely um, fantastic during the course of the last 12 months because. You know, if you think we did go from, you know, teaching normally into delivering predominantly online within sort of a few days, I, I was quite surprised and incredibly impressed by how quickly that happened, I have to say. And, you know, we've got to bear in mind that we, we've all got different levels of ability on these things. Now, I can use this to speak with you and I can do basic functioning. But, you know, compared with some of my colleagues, there's an awful lot I can't do on my computer that, that, that others can do. So. You know, depending on where you're at with that, online delivery becomes much more daunting, doesn't it? And much more difficult. So I think that, you know, hats off to colleagues who have responded to the challenge. Fantastic work from the technology support team who have enabled this to happen. And for anybody who's had a problem, they have responded. And again, they've worked tirelessly to do that. And then we've got the, as I say, the Centre for Collaborative Learning who are providing opportunities for people to broaden their knowledge and abilities in specific aspects of, of, of teaching and pedagogy so that, you know, hopefully we are seeing a process of continuous improvement in terms of our teaching, whether be that be online, be blended or face to face. We want that continuous um, improvement. And we get that, you know, if you look at schools and you look at colleges, uh, that's something they're committed to. Why should universities be any different? Uh, we, should, we should be committed to the highest quality teaching on a constant basis. And that's what we're striving for. And bear in mind, I, I come, as I said before, from a teaching background and my wife's a teacher. And, you know, so it, it, it runs right the way through the, the family. We're absolutely committed to, you know, that's that um, spirit of continuous improvement. Absolutely. And students, you know, they expect, you know, a quality education. They expect that kind of classroom engagement, that engaging. And so we, we hear sometimes death by PowerPoint and our, our lecturers just going through slides and students probably falling asleep when they're turning the cameras off, but it's, it's around how do you create that classroom culture where everyone feels, you know, part of part of the experience and, and feel valued really in the classroom. Yeah, I mean, I smile at death by PowerPoint, but that, that goes back years and years and years, ever since the advent of PowerPoint, you know, when we got carried away perhaps with the the opportunity to create slides. Like, I mean, I go, I go back. I started my teaching where if you wanted to do a handout, you, you, you did a carbonated sheet and ran it off what's called a bander machine. You, you printed it out there. And then then I was on acetates where you used to draw on them yourself. And, um, and now we can do delivery like we can, which gives so much potential. But you're right. If you get it wrong, it can be quite a dry, uh, dry session. So, you know, we, we can all learn all the time. And, and, and I know that, um, you know, my colleagues, you know, are really committed to ensuring we deliver as good a teaching experience as we can way back I'm, I'm trying to think now probably about 10 years ago I, I i was operating working on a scheme um with with colleagues right across the university what we were called the, the world uh, world-class teaching initiative what do we mean by world-class teaching now whether anything can be world-class is, is is another matter i get that but even back then you know we were we were having really good conversations about how we continue to drive up and improve the quality of teaching in the university that commitment has remained i can see that and you know it's now being delivered uh, but we're using different vehicles within the university to provide that support for staff so i think students can be reassured that there's an awful lot of work going on to um make sure that the the teaching you know is as good as it can be but i always remember one thing uh, that that i learned when i did my own teacher training they always said um never excellent because it can always be better and i think that's right and we in, in that spirit of continuous improvement and lifelong learning we have to accept that not all our sessions are as good as we would like them to be and therefore you know reflect on it work on it and try and make it better next time absolutely yeah yeah continuous improvement um speak to students it's that co-creation of the curriculum letting students have an input and making sure it's an experience everyone's everyone wants to make the most of brilliant yeah okay. 
we're going to talk a little bit about academic study skills support now. So yeah. as you're aware, the withdrawal of the, the WISER the wiser service um, towards the end of last year really left students without an alternative provision. Um, how is the university going to ensure adequate academic study skills supports in place? And where do we direct students to in, in the meantime while the university are working through those alternative plans? Right. Well, uh, we communicated and acted with regard to wiser not very well. OK, so uh, and so I'm sorry about that. Um, we should have done um, better with that. And it just things seem to slip through the gap. We haven't really withdrawn the wiser academic study skills support service, except that that's what it appeared like. The material is now back and we're providing similar levels of support through the faculties. And if that's not being appropriately communicated, we need to do more on the communication. But uh, again, PVC for students and teaching is, is working on that. I think more importantly, and um, is, is what comes for the future, as you quite rightly said. WISER was really, really good. WISER is really, really good. The only problem is that WISER probably doesn't reach out to quite as many students as we would like. We would like more students to benefit from uh, having study skills support than we're able to deliver through, through WISER. Now, ideally, we'd embed study skills into the normal curriculum, but that is not without its challenge, both from a teaching and a learning perspective. So that's something we will continue to develop. But we're also going to have a central uh, study skills service that will help a wider number of students. Those plans are being drawn up now, and we need to just identify the, the final kind of structure, how it's going to operate, and then we've got uh, the, the remaining months of this academic year to put it in place in readiness for next next year. So WISER continues for now, uh, although in a slightly different way. There is communication out there, but uh, and Andrew's aware that we need to do more communication and get more information out so the students can access that. So that's there. But we recognise we need study skills. We would like it in the curriculum. We're going to work on that through this new curriculum framework. But additionally, there will be central study skills support, uh, but it will be hopefully even more accessible than WISER was. Well, thank you, Graham. I know it's been a it's been a real tough um, kind of topic for a lot of you know staff and students alike, and um, it's great to just have a bit of clarity there around you know um, how how it's going to function going forward. So thank you. Yeah. Well, well, and th and I know that the SU has been very committed to that. So so likewise, thank you. Um, so we know the university has been working hard to help students achieve you know learning outcomes. Mm. Uh, we know the pandemic is not the university's fault at all. Um, but however, some students feel as though they aren't get, getting those learning outcomes they reasonably did expect. Um, are the university going to offer a refund for those students? I, I, it's We're not at a point yet, I don't think, to identify whether the learning outcomes uh, will be achieved. As I said earlier, the our our intention from the very outset was to do everything that we could to make sure that students could complete their studies to the extent that they achieved the award that they uh, set out to achieve. And they achieved that award within the time frame that they expected to achieve it. So that if you're due to graduate this year, you get the chance to graduate this year, you enter the jobs market as planned, uh, or you go into your uh, postgraduate qualification as planned. If you're in your first or second years, the commitment is to ensure that you are able to complete your studies this year and then you can progress to your next year without any further delay. The learning outcomes are assessed, of course, through the assessment process. So, um, you know, generally speaking, uh, if the if the student is successful through their assessments and their exams, that's how they identify that they've achieved their their learning outcomes. Yeah. So to do that is requiring sort of the uh, further investment in the support services we talked about, the investment in the online learning, the investment in the campus changes to ensure COVID safe. So it puts quite a lot of financial pressure on the university. So our focus has been on, let's get that right. Let's make sure that the students are able to achieve their learning outcomes. We assess them and they can progress in the appropriate time frame, and I think that's that's what we're committed to. If that doesn't happen, then uh, in uh, and I think it will be in a very isolated uh, instances. Then we 
uh, might need to look at it. But I don't think that, um, you know, right across the sector, the issue of tuition fee refunds is a, is a really challenging one. It's a very complex one yeah. um, because I've mentioned before, so many different types of students who fund their studies in so many different ways, but many of them who are funding their tuition through the student loan. So how would that be refunded? Uh, and who would that refund go to? And how do um, universities continue to deliver what it is they need to deliver to enable students to achieve uh, the learning outcomes that I've just described if we don't have the funding to do that? So it, it, it's a really challenging one. I believe we should focus, as I've said, on ensuring that we put in place the mechanisms, the systems and the processes to enable the students to achieve those learning outcomes and to progress in the right time frame. Yeah, thank you. So I think, yeah, it's, it's different, isn't it? Because we have some students who pay their fees up front, such as international students or people who don't take those student loans out for religious purposes. Yeah. Um, but that, that is that is something to, to look at. But this week, it was really interesting to actually chat to some film production students and uh, media production students. And there seems to be maybe some significant changes that are going to have to be made to those assignments. So students are actually um, going to be able to, you know, progress to the next year as they're going to have to access certain technologies. So it does put a question there around, are we confident about, you know, those students graduating in, in the job market with a with a film production degree, for example, that have not really had a chance to put films together and, you know, can only put little clips together. So it's just about whether we have that like, like we mentioned a bit earlier around that confidence in, um, with employers um, or the confidence with the students as well, that that piece of paper in the hand, they can, they can say, OK, I know how to use that software. I know how to use that equipment. Well, the thing is, uh, I guess I, you know, I'm, I'm no film uh, production specialist, so I'd, I'd be wary of, of, of talking there. But, you know, when we do a programme, inevitably, you, you soon find that you come across technology or uh, equipment or processes that are slightly different from those that you specifically uh, worked on in the university environment. But what you've got are the uh, understand the un the underpinning knowledge and understanding of the concepts and the principles, etc. Those transferable skills that allow you to adapt. And I think that's the most critical piece. Sure. So uh, I still believe that that the students who graduate will still be recognised in the market. <clears throat> and still will have the ability to do what it is they need to do when they choose to go into their um, their chosen profession. <clears throat> but as I, say, I can't, I can't, I can't, and, and shouldn't uh, comment specifically on film production. But I realise that there will be elements of, of practical courses that have had to alter uh, as a consequence of not being able to access all of the equipment at, at the time that they would otherwise have, have been able to get to it. And I think that's what's being done now with obviously your deputy vice chancellor um, and the, the students and teaching the pro vice chancellor there to see, you know, when can we bring those students back on campus to make sure that they're getting that that bit of learning um, that, to catch up. Brilliant. Um, it's been so great to see, you know, during the pandemic, the uni also supporting students with, you know, targeted support, including food and care packages, those well-being check-ins, you know, those mental health check-ins through the well-being team, um, to isolating students in university halls and further freebies, such as the free pizza, which I was very much appreciated. <laughs> but there's a there's a, um, a section here around we have students living in uh, private accommodation um, who feel like they've been a bit left out by some of the, the support that university hall students have received. What more can the university look to do to ensure private accommodation students are supported through not, not just the pandemic, but even after, you know, once restrictions ease and that they are feeling like the university actually care about them? Yeah, well, the, the university absolutely cares about them, care about all of our students. I guess you, your point, though, is, well, how do you show that? You know, they don't feel it. I mean, if you come onto campus at the moment, the uh, uh, for the for umpteen weeks now, uh, and, and this was before Christmas as well, the food outlets that were open were providing complimentary uh, food and drink to uh, staff and students. So it, it wasn't restricted to which hall you lived in. So you, you could come on and, and access that. And there was pizza, because uh, I know uh, lots of people who have uh, benefited and enjoyed the, the, the pizza piece. So, you know, we do try to do things through the campus operations, which we recognise are then available to students who commute, students who live in private accommodation, students who live in, in private halls compared with private uh, residences. You know, there's, there's, there's again, such a, a, a contrasting range of 
students and their their experiences um and we've got you know mature students and we've got students who had just left school we've got students who uh own their own homes students who you know it, it it is really difficult to to provide exactly the same to those students based on support uh in terms of their accommodation but we can provide common support on campus and that's what we were trying to do with that but you know we we have recognized and this probably brings it you know the pandemic has has highlighted certain things that perhaps none of us particularly focused on previously you know i don't think you really would have differentiated between a student who was living in private accommodation and a student living in our own accommodation pre-pandemic because there was no real difference in terms of the experience you went to your room you had, you know everything was standard and you came onto the university for your you know other experiences hopefully we'll return to that but we will be more mindful of the fact that we've got this broad range of students i think it's brought that into much greater um focus hasn't it that we've got this really very very different range of students who all have different uh, experiences based on 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 where they're coming from and uh you know, before you didn't you didn't notice it as much, but we do notice it now. You know, the, the students who are commuting, how does that impact on them compared to the students living here? Very, very difficult. So the point you raise is, is a good one. Uh, we have we we would of course doing things with the best of intention to reach out to students who were in hall where we had direct understanding of who's there, how we can help them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, once you do that, you know, it opens it up to comparison for students who aren't accessing that because they're somewhere else. Uh, how how do we do that? It's it's a, it's a challenge, um, but we will look at that in more detail. Yeah, and I think some of the little steps that the university have taken to give um, students who would need to do uh, online deliveries, for example, who are isolating, you know, priority slots with certain supermarkets. That's just been, you know, it's not a massive thing, but it's something, you know, really actually is going to help students because we know when when the pandemic hit, a lot of um, those priority slots were getting taken up. Um, and it was really hard to kind of get those online deliveries. So things like that, the university can do to ensure, you know, that that's kind of like um, that parity of experience is, is really helpful as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I accept that. And um, we do need to, to see how that I, I'm, I'm, you know, we, we hope that in the future, again, the contrast won't be so apparent. But uh, but you're right. You raise a very good point. Brilliant. Um, so this is more of a staff responsiveness uh, kind of question. Um, some students are not receiving responses to emails from, you know, staff on their on their on their course within three working days, and we know that's the kind of you know the leeway we give staff to respond to emails. This is obviously leaving students um, having to constantly chase up emails, which you know can be embarrassing really when they need to know some you know, important information. Um, what would you say to staff who are not adhering to this communications policy? Well, I would I would remind them. Of the communications policy, and, and I would imagine that uh, the vast majority are able to to comply. And I'm sure that, uh, that 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 the odd reminder just prompts members of staff to to respond. The only thing I'd say on this as well, and, and I'm not trying to defend anybody, but um, I think it's important to remember that everybody's finding life very hard under the these working conditions, yeah. and sometimes. An email may slip through the net based on the challenges and pressures that colleagues are finding. So, you know, I cannot begin to imagine what it must be like to try and work from home and homeschool at the same time or work from home and to look after people who uh, may be vulnerable or indeed people who may be suffering uh, as a consequence of, of the virus directly. Now, none of that's uh, an excuse. We've still got to uh, ensure that we can provide the service that, that we offer. But I, I do think we're just in that kind of period of time at the moment where we just need to recognise that there, there are potentially quite good reasons why something has slipped. Um, I don't know about you, but, you know, I've contacted a number of organisations and companies looking for a service and, I, you know, and it's not they've not been able to provide it in the same time. Uh, frame as previously, or indeed, you, can, you know, just because of of the COVID restrictions that are that are placed on them and how it's altered their their way of working. So, um, my advice would be to students to to do the polite chase and reminder. Yeah. If you then find the resistance, then you know, obviously escalate it. But but I think that you you know probably sometimes somebody may have just missed it as a consequence of the different working practices and the workloads. You know, and although 
not the same digital poverty, but even some of my colleagues who are living in parts of the country where the broadband is not yet fiber to the house. And if they've got more than one person utilizing that broadband at any given time, so you're trying to teach, well, maybe your children are, uh, you know, okay. there's all those, those, those problems that, that are not anybody's fault at all. And we've got to work around it. So I, I'm sorry if people aren't getting that response. I think it'd be in the minority. I think, you know, there's, there's probably a very good reason for it. And a gentle reminder, hopefully, will we'll, we'll resolve it. Yeah, I think our students fully appreciate, you know, the stresses and the struggles staff are going through at this this, this time uh, in terms of workload. And um, if, if, if they're not responding in three working days, I think it's just, you know, another another kind of uh, reminder there. But um, it's um, it's it's just ensuring maybe we embed that within induction and that kind of yeah. your um, boundaries and your kind of um, making sure students know who to contact, when to contact and, you know, when when is the most appropriate time to, to kind of raise a specific question? Is an email the right way or is it a different way that we need to approach that? Yeah, we will do that. And of course, during normal, um, more normal working, you can come in, you've got department offices and you can go to the office, can't you? And you can, there are other ways of communicating. The problem at the moment is because you're, you know, doing everything through your computer. You feel a, a little bit removed, don't you? And and you, you, your only way of communicating is that you can't then, when you're in next, just knock on the door and, and, and you know, yeah. gosh, how we all hope for a quick return to that because it's so much better. Um, but, you know, and I do I do take the point you make there that, that students uh, are very much appreciating the challenges that colleagues face. And we've had some lovely emails from students who have been thanking tutors and colleagues for the work they've done, the support and recognising the efforts that people are making. So um, so I'm well aware that the students appreciate it. And I'm well aware that colleagues are putting in a great job. And, um, you know, I'm re again, I go back to what I said at the start, really proud of, of the way the university as a whole has responded to this. That's colleagues and the work they've done and students for the way they've you know taken this on very stoically and and, and got on with it you know and um these are I, I was i did an interview the other the other day and um somebody said you, do you have sympathy with the students that was the question and i undoubtedly do you know i think back to uh, university life being some of the best years of my life and, and you know to, to to lose that as a consequence of, of the pandemic you know i, I think it's, a, it's 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 a tragedy so um but i think They've taken it really well and everybody's responded really well. And I very much appreciate that. Yeah, it's all those little things that you see through Twitter of uh, staff saying, my student, um, these are the comments, you know, I came back off um, annual leave and, you know, they're saying, oh, I'm happy to, to see you back now. And, and that, that kind of lifts uh, staff's mood. So, you know, anything positive, any any kind of positive feedback students have about um, lecturers, they love to hear it. And it's um, and it's not always, you know, the negative, negative all the time. Um, and it's good that you you get to, to know about the, the good things that are happening in the institution as well. Well, it cheers me up as well, because uh, you can imagine an awful lot of the problems within the university come across my desk. So I'm always delighted to to hear some of the good news. And, you know, and I say to people when, uh, when I, you know, keep us informed, not just of the stuff that's going wrong. Let us know when it's going right, because we really appreciate it. Brilliant. Uh, just like moving on now, we have. A-level students or B-tech students or those looking to retrain in a specific area and those who have just been out of the education system in, in a while. How is the university going to support those students, um, new students, uh, with their transition into HE? Yeah, well, we're going to uh, already our recruitment uh, and uh, missions team are looking at how they can reach out better to those um, students. We've got a well-developed network of partnerships with local schools and colleges. so. If they're in the college or the school system, we're going to try and pick it up from there and make sure we work closely with those bodies. If they've been out of the system for a while, we've got a full range of foundation programs, uh, one for every area within the university that enables them to have that uh, very well supported start that gets them back into higher education. And we're working to look at what we can do to provide short courses. Um, you'll know that there's some changes in funding that will uh, potentially allow students to be able to do courses on a more modular basis, you know, and, and and we are working with the rest of the sector, as you said, to encourage government to focus on maximising the um, support for short courses, providing funding for additional events that are useful to provide students with greater uh, range of ability and skill that will help them into, into the workforce. 
And this this concept of bite sized learning, and we've been talking to you know people, even even members of the board, you'll have heard them raise it, saying that they've got uh, contacts and colleagues who are looking to get into something else, and how do they get that that bite sized piece of learning that will help them to transition from being you know somebody who can do that to somebody who can do that. So we need we need more of that, much more of that, and that's that's something we're looking looking at. And um, we've got Professor Sinjin Crean, who is the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research, Innovation, and Enterprise. He's looking at how we can further develop our continuing professional development activity as well. So for people who don't want to come in to do a full time or part time full program, there's other things they can do. It's part of that upskilling, reskilling that we're going to need, not only to help individuals but to help our economy to get back on its feet after this pandemic. So lots of work going on around that area. Absolutely. And I think that that kind of professional development is, is, is really close to my heart and it's really great. And I think it's, it's a good question around is are those students that take those opportunities the ones that really need them or are they the ones that we're going to do them anyway? And I yeah. think that's something to, to make sure we really do some targeted, you know, um, once of those because we are a widening participation university. Yeah, you know, you hit the nail on the head there because the biggest challenge is to, um, make sure you're 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 reaching out to those who are would most benefit and but who are most difficult to to reach to. Um, and you're right, an awful lot of stuff you put on, you know, it's the it's the, the people who would normally engage anyway will take you off on that opportunity. So which is great, and you want them to, but you want to make sure that others get the opportunity as well. So I think uh, yeah, there's 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 more work to do on that. There always has been. I mean, you know, we haven't as a as a sector cracked that in many years of, of trying but you know we all know the significant benefits that um, individuals as well as society get from people going to university so we've got to continue to promote it encourage it provide the opportunity break down the barriers because you know I am absolutely committed to ensuring that as many people as possible who have the ability to benefit from university education get the opportunity and that's the majority of people so we you know we need to bring them through to enhance their their life chances. And actually, we all benefit, don't we? Because society becomes richer and stronger as a consequence. So, you know, it, it's a win-win. Absolutely. I know the university wants to advance their EDI agenda going forward, and it's been great to work with Lee Cassie, who's the Director of Equality, Diversity, Inclusion, and launching the um, the 15 studentships uh, opportunities that are going to be there to uh, support um, those from diverse backgrounds to to, to, to get on with ed their education and support some of those those priorities. Um, and it's great that Suntosh, who was a previous president, has uh, been accepted onto one of those. Yeah, yeah, no, great. I mean, uh... You know, Suntosh did uh, some wonderful work last year. You've carried it on this year, um, which we we really appreciate. And it's great that she's going to continue to be working within the university. So it's fantastic. And, you know, it's a big agenda for us. And, you know, but Pr Pradeep's doing a good job and it's progressing well. Still lots to do, but there always will be. You know, we've just got to keep keep going at it. Absolutely. And just um, you touched on it before around staff having to share digital technology with with people in their household, the, the Wi-Fi, whether that be or the laptop, whatever it might be. And um, we, we probably will have the same with, with students and that, that transition to HE and supporting that that kind of um, area around digital poverty as well. Um, and is, is the university going to look to to ensure that is still a, a priority, you know, September for going forward? Yeah, I mean, we've definitely got that issue with with students. We recognise that it's been, you know, we we we've moved um, uh, an awful lot to ensure that we can uh, support as many of students with those issues as possible. As I mentioned before, you know, distributing laptops, distributing dongles, uh, and, and so forth. We need to keep looking at that for sure. I think we we'd forgotten really, uh, and again, I said this this brings an awful lot of things to to your um, attention as a consequence of the pandemic, but you know, really hadn't thought about, you know, if the, there's only one machine in the house, you know, who gets priority to use it, who gets access to it, how do you do it, and how does that impact on your work? So it's something that we do need to continue to consider and make sure that, you know, students are getting, uh, you know, equal learning opportunities as much as possible. So, yeah, it, you know, definitely we'll continue to look at that. Absolutely, yeah, and accessible education for everyone is, is uh, yeah. looking forward. Brilliant. OK, just the final question now. You'll be pleased to know. <laughs> um, so, you know, honestly, how have you found leading the University of Central Lancashire in the pandemic? And, you know, what's been the biggest positive and what's been the biggest challenge? I guess the biggest challenge right the way through, I'd, I'd say, can I I'll go for two of them if I can? The uncertainty, yeah. the uncertainty is really difficult, uh, makes it very difficult to plan. 
And we were planning and, and making decisions on things we'd never made decisions about before we, the first time we'd faced the issues or the challenges. And um, what we found there was that you make a decision and then all of the unintended consequences that you then have to unpick and do and, and, and so forth. So the, the uncertainty and the challenge would be one. Uh, sorry, the, the uncertainty uh, would be one. And the other challenge has been just not having people around. Uh, I, I like the interaction with colleagues. I like the interaction with students. And, you know, when you can't do that, it makes it a much lonelier and um, much more difficult job, actually. You're not really getting that that benefit of that vibrant um, interaction with, you know, enthusiastic, keen individuals. So I have, I have missed that. Uh, the biggest positive has been working closely with colleagues who have stepped up to the plate and really done a fantastic job. So I give huge credit to my close team who I work with. Uh, we've been, I think you know, we've been meeting at five o'clock every day since we went into the first lockdown. And that's forged some really strong relationships, people some, doing some really good work. But there are also other good relationships. We've we've highlighted the, the, the work with the student union, um, student services, all of those sorts of things. They've been the positives just to see how people have stood up and um and made a such a wonderful contribution i can't thank them enough and i am immensely proud of the contribution the university has made as a whole that's its staff and its students over the course of the last year uh, in supporting the region in fighting the the, the pandemic and it really is a very significant achievement so it's fantastic that must be the most positive i couldn't be more proud Oh, well, it was really great to, to hear about your, your positive, um, your positives there and also challenges because it has been, you know, even leading the student union in the, in the pandemic, it's just been a huge challenge. And this is my first first role, you know, in employment, <laughs> uh, in the full time role anyway. And um, it's it's been strange not not being around people and having those, you know, conversations or knocking on people's door and just having the, and it's a team's meeting now to have a chat with someone. And, you know, that, that sometimes we go on half an hour, an hour just to <laughs> have a chat. But no, I think it's, um, yeah, once we're back on campus and we, we have that kind of um, buzz around campus, I think it'll be a lot more enjoyable. I hope so. Well, it will be. It will be. And I, I, I hope, um, you know, you you do get the opportunity to experience that because it's a very strange year for a, a student union president to be you know, working from home, isn't it, when when it's all about engagement. But it is for us. And I, yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting people back, getting that buzz and, um, you know, living a, a more normal life you know, within universities. And, and, you know, it is a great privilege to work or study within universities i think and they're great places um we've well, been in them a long time now but uh, absolutely fantastic the novelty hasn't worn off yeah and it and you know what it wouldn't be a q a if i didn't mention sport so as you're aware um the university's sport complex is the arena and the Sir Tom Finney sports center will be hosting the the welsh uh, national team for the upcoming rugby league world cup and i know you're an avid you know rugby rugby fan um do you want to just give everyone a bit of an overview of that well yeah i'm, I'm a i'm a Predominantly a rugby union uh, fan, yes. I, so that was my my sport when uh, I was younger and and could still run. And uh, before rugby took its toll on me, yeah, no, uh, love rugby. And um, up until recently, was coaching locally with uh, with um, juniors because my son was playing. Um, but I, I played at university and then played when I left, and uh, really really enjoyed that. Uh, but I, I enjoy all sport. I watch watch both codes of rugby avidly so i'm delighted that we are hosting you know one of the things i will say is that we've uh, reorganized our, our sport infrastructure in the university and we've set ourselves as you know quite uh, um, a challenging strategy with targets in to you know become a more prominent university with with regard to sport uh, and my immediate focus is on tonight sale sharks are at home to exeter chiefs if you're into the rugby union premiership uh, so that's our local premiership team but tomorrow England, who have not been convincing in their first two Six Nations games, go to Wales. So uh, topical that you should mention to, to play them in Cardiff. And um, that will be the big focus of the weekend for me. So fingers crossed for England and apologies if you're a, a Welsh fan. I remember saying something about the rugby this time last year and then on Monday bumping into one of our lecturers who was uh, Welsh and a Welsh supporter who uh, gave me a hard time. So uh, let's hope it's a great game, but I'm looking for one particular outcome. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting, and I think it's um, so so great for our students to actually take up volunteering opportunities uh, later on in the year. Whether that whether you're studying on a sport course or you're not studying on a sport course, um, you know, volunteering in a in a tournament really close to the campus, what a great way to you know develop yourself and develop uh, your skills going forward. Oh yeah, I, I, my advice to uh, to anybody um, thinking about the future, volunteering is, is is always a really really good thing to do. But any opportunity that comes up, even if you're unsure about it, take the opportunity because you never know quite uh, how it will uh, benefit you in the future. And you know, the volunteering, doing other things, just building that CV always uh, looks good. So the opportunity to get involved in you know, international professional activity and events. This happens to be rugby league, but it could be anything. You know, take that opportunity if you can, put the extra effort in. It will certainly pay dividends in the end. Absolutely. Wise words. <laughs> <laughs> from the plan. Um, so uh, thank you so much Graham it's been absolutely brilliant and uh, wonderful to speak to you today and thanks to all the uh, students who sent in uh, your questions very very uh, important questions that I think you've done really well answering um, and is there any other final comments you'd like to make Graham? No just thank you Salika thanks for the time and the opportunity and thanks as you've said to the students who have sent the questions in and, um, you know, hopefully it gives you some insight into uh, what we're trying to do as a university. But, uh, you know, to reassure you that we'll continue to communicate on a regular basis and, and we'll continue to work together to resolve this problem. <laughs>